All right, well, good morning and happy Palm Sunday, church family. Um, If you have your Bibles with you, I hope you do. Go ahead and open them to the dramatic conclusion of the book of Ruth. While you're doing that, if you're a kiddo or maybe you're a visitor who's joining us and you're not familiar with what Palm Sunday is, uh, today and the traditional church calendar, we remember that Jesus entered Jerusalem. And so if you grew up in the church or maybe you have, if you're a kiddo and you have a a picture Bible, you might remember Jesus on the donkey and crowds and crowds of people coming out of the big city, surrounding him with palm branches and shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And the reason that this event is significant to us as Christians is twofold. One, it is one of the few times in Jesus's ministry where he was recognized as the king he was and the king he is. And two, it's one of those events that prepares our heart for what's called Holy Week. This is the final week of Jesus's life and ministry in the city of Jerusalem. Um, And we're building towards Good Friday, where Jesus will die on the cross in our place for our sins. And so kids, when we look at the cross, we remember God's love, that he loved us enough to give himself For God's glory and our good, he died in our place for our sins. And then we get to look forward to next Sunday is Easter Sunday. It's the biggest Sunday uh, for the church the whole year. We celebrate that Jesus rose from death, that he conquered Satan, sin, and death. And especially in a time of global health pandemic, um, it is so important for us to celebrate the resurrection that we have a hope that is unshakable regardless of what's happening in our world. So today, though, we're going to conclude the book of Ruth. And to get us started, I want to ask you a quick question. What is your favorite quarantine TV show? Now, I know some of you would probably say Tiger King. And I'll be honest with you. I know the guy has crazy hair. I know he has tigers. I know he just said recently that he wants Brad Pitt or the guy who played Joe Dirt to play him in a movie. But I'll be honest with you, I have no concept of what that show is even about. I have not seen a single episode. Uh, Perhaps, though, your quarantine TV show is something old school. You like, say, an I Love Lucy or the Dick Van Dyke show. Or maybe you like uh, funny shows or you like Cheers or Friends or The Office or Parks and Rec. Maybe you're into something more dramatic and you like Mad Men or The Sopranos or Breaking Bad or Lost. But one of the things I want to share with you to kind of set up our time this morning is a challenge that I heard about a couple of years ago when uh, Netflix streaming first became a thing. And the challenge was this, that you, you pick a show, any show, and you watch the first episode, the pilot episode, and then the very last episode, the series finale. And what's interesting is you can see how characters start and how they end. Um, You can see if the writers of the show had a clear story arc, a way of concluding it or not. And the reason that this little challenge is actually significant is because one, a film critic or um, TV critic rather said this. He said in movies, there's clearly a beginning, a middle and an end. But in TV shows, there's a beginning, there's a middle, and then it just keeps going until it dies out and becomes unprofitable. And one of the things I wanted to challenge us on this morning is that often we have a TV show screenwriter mentality about our life. We know how it started. We're kind of experiencing, we're in the middle right now, and we're trying to guess about how it might end. We're trying to write out endings, which especially in a time of crisis, we have a way of panicking, of freaking out, of thinking it could go this way and it could go that way, but we have no idea. And so what I want to encourage us to is as we conclude the book of Ruth, that God is the producer, the director, the screenwriter, like a movie. He knows our beginning, our middle, and our end. He knows how this is going to all pull together. And spoiler alert, it's going to pull together for our good. One of the cool things about the book of Ruth, in conclusion, is that we see that God loves the comeback story. God loves the happy ending. God is a God of redemption. And so to kind of just finish off our story, let me give you four highlights, four ways that God is going to bring about redemption. He's going to give Ruth a husband. He's going to give Naomi um, a baby. Um, He's going to give the nation a king, and he's going to give the world a Messiah. And so um, we begin with a wedding. And it's interesting because the entire book of Ruth, we've been tracing the romance um, of Ruth and Boaz, and then the dramatic conclusion is basically one verse. And so they were married and she became his wife. And what I love about this passage, what's so beautiful, is what's happening here. 
that Ruth's status is being forever changed. We've seen in the book five times it's called her a Moabite, and yet in one moment she is brought from a foreigner into the family and she's given a new status as a wife. And more than that, she's given a child. Which when you hear about the Lord who gave her conception, the reason this is so powerful is that God hasn't really explicitly been in the book of Ruth very much. But in this time, we clearly see him reaching down and him blessing them with this child. And this is significant for two reasons. One, um, hope deferred makes the heart sick, the scriptures say. And you can only imagine how much Ruth has desired to have a child for so long. And finally, God brings about that redemption and he blesses her with this baby. For 10 years in Moab with her first husband, uh, Malon, she was infertile. And now God gives her the blessing of a child. And the reason this is significant as well is that because Ruth is the little story, the, the story of Ruth and Boaz and the romance, but it is nested in the big story of the Bible, we need to sort of pull out the lens. So imagine, if you will, if you are on, uh, say, like uh, Google Earth, and you're on Street View, and you're looking at your house or your apartment, and you're like, that's unbelievable. They, you know, it, it's always like five years old, and you're like, oh, we moved that, or that's not there anymore, or whatever. But then you zoom out from Street View all the way up, and you can see, you know, your city, and then your state, and your country, and the world. Well, imagine that we do that for a quick second. Because what we find is that this child actually connects us to the entire story of the Bible. And what we learn in the story of the Bible is that God created us to be with him. We sinned against him. And God promised that he would bring about redemption. That this story would not end in distress and disaster, but rather in redemption for those who would call out to God. And so he gives the promise of... Um, uh, that there will be a redeemer coming from the seed of the very first woman. And so we trace that family line. And what's interesting is we see this ongoing uh, motif, theme throughout the Bible. And that is that God's people say uh, Abraham and Sarah and Genesis 21, they can't conceive, they're infertile. And then God blesses them with this miracle baby. Then in Genesis 25, Isaac and Rebekah cannot conceive, and God blesses them with this miracle baby. In Genesis 29, Rachel cannot conceive, and God blesses her with a miracle baby. And each time we're tracing this royal line, waiting, anticipating for this promised Redeemer. And each time this miracle baby is born, it's like a big spotlight that God shines on human history saying, watch this family line. Redemption is coming. So we need to watch this little boy. Which brings us to our second point, and that is God provides for Naomi a baby. And, and this is not just a, a baby. Babies are wonderful and beautiful and with foul cheeks and cute eyes and are adorable, right? But for Naomi, this is more than just a baby. This is her legacy. This is redemption. This is the carrying on of her family name. And so look what it says. Uh, then the women said to Naomi, this is an ancient baby shower. And remember that Naomi said to the women when she first came in, don't call me Mara, don't call me Pleasant, call, or sorry, don't call me Naomi Pleasant, call me Mara Bitter. Uh, I went away full. The Lord brought me back empty. She has been miserable. She has been depressed. She has grieved. She has lamented. And God has been nothing but consistently faithful her two biggest problems were the famine and the lack of food and then the death and the lack of family. And God has met her need for food and provision and her need for family. And the community recognizes this and they come around her and they say, Blessed be the Lord who's not left you this day without a Redeemer. And they're not talking about Boaz who married Ruth and brought them into his household and will provide for them and buy back the land. They're actually talking about this little baby. This little baby will redeem Naomi's legacy. It says, may his name be renowned in Israel. And which is really high praise, especially for a little baby. They're not saying, hey, may he get out of diapers quickly. May he learn to become potty trained. May he finish preschool. May his name be renowned in Israel. This baby is part of a royal line and legacy. May he be a part of this promise we have for a redeemer. He shall be to you, Naomi, a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. Which is this beautiful promise. I, I think about, in particular now, as we are um, in uh, quarantine and we're spending a lot of time together as families, uh, that I think one of our culture's biggest lies is that 
Uh, family is a shackle. Family is a burden. And I think the problem that our culture experiences is that we have lost the distinction between a blessing and a burden because both are heavy. I'm not trying to say that children aren't work and that it's not a challenge to be a parent, but I'm also trying to say it is a great blessing. Your children are a blessing. And I want to encourage you, if you're a parent and you're watching this, um, as I'm seeing the memes and I'm seeing the posts, I'm talking and interacting with many of us, we need to, and this is as true for me as anyone else, we need to shift our perspective that God has given us this time, that we can grow our intimacy and connections together as a family, that our children are a blessing, not a burden. Yes, it's a responsibility. Yes, it's a heavy responsibility, but it is a blessing in the midst of this. They are a restorer of life is what the community says to Naomi. And I'm thinking about my girls and all the fun that we've had recently. They love running out and jumping in puddles. It's such a joy. I can get just really bitter and jaded and cynical and to see their love for life and learning, they restore my life. I just learned, in fact, that you can kiss your own head. And I was like, no, guys, that's impossible. No, apparently not. All you have to do is... So there you go. I can't argue with that. They are a restorer of life. And then I love this a nourisher of your old age. I have a grandmother that is in a nursing home right now, 93 years old. My older brother uh, goes and meets with her uh, at least once a week and cares for her. And I can't help but think of them when I hear this idea of that, that um, it'll, he'll nourish your old age. Uh, imagine, for instance, a young man that will take her by the arm and walk with her down the path or push her in a wheelchair as she is older or um, take her out to dinner or bring her gifts or tell her jokes or help her with her puzzles that not only will he provide a legacy for you and your family name will continue, but he'll take care of you when you're older. What a blessing. God's relentless blessings in the life of Naomi. And here's the, I, I love this too that one of the blessings that Naomi has seemed to never recognize in the midst of all this is Ruth. And here, the community gives Ruth the highest praise imaginable. This is, this is the ancient Oscar for best family member ever. Look what they say here. It says, For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. And what it's saying there is that seven sons... Seven was the ideal family size in ancient Israel. Seven is the number of perfection, wholeness, fullness. Sons were highly esteemed and seen as a great blessing. And this is taking that traditional mindset, flipping it on its head. And this is the highest praise for any woman in all the scriptures apart from Proverbs 31. They are saying that she is, she is worth more to you and loves you more than seven sons the number of perfection. This is the highest praise possible. And then there's this beautiful moment. Uh, you can Google search this, um, pictures of Naomi with little baby Obed. But here, old and had been very bitter Naomi um, is receiving the tangible blessings of God. Not because she deserves it, not because she earned it, not because anything about her attitude or her words or her actions warranted God to bless her, but just because he is good. And he loves a happy ending. He loves the story of redemption. He loves us despite us. That is the love of God. And so it says, Then Naomi took the child, laid him on her lap, and became his nurse. Ruth gives the child to Naomi. And not permanently or legally, but symbolically, this child will carry on Naomi's legacy. And I, one thing I think we can take away from this is that in this time when we are quarantined, when um, we have had to work through the emotions of having to cancel plans, having to reschedule important events in our life, that everything, the, really the world has put, been put on pause, if you will. And there's a tendency to be frustrated, to be grumpy, to be upset, to be bitter. God, why would you allow this? Here's one mindset that I would encourage you to. Think about all the blessings that we have right now. When you're tempted to be bitter, when you're tempted to be discouraged, you have a roof over your head. You have running water. Uh, most of us have our health despite the health crisis. We're surrounded by family. We, um, we know the living God and we have a hope for all of eternity. Allow God's goodness and his mercy and his blessings to soothe and sustain you in the midst of all of these challenges. And then we see that God provides a king for Israel. Notice it says, oh, and I would say this, um, 
Okay, so what's interesting, I know some of you guys out there are World War II buffs and you love World War II. It's so dramatic, right? You have D-Day, you have Pearl Harbor. Um, it's, it's as though every nation in the world is caught up into this dramatic um, event that really transformed our world from uh, medicine to technology to finances to politics. Everything changed. It was climactic. And what's interesting, though, is if you've ever read the letters of uh, soldiers that were uh, in fields of combat during World War II, you find that um, they don't have the perspective we have now looking back. To them, they're complaining about wet socks and bad mo uh, food and talking about how they miss their loved ones at home. And when you read these things, you're like, guys, like you were part of something so dramatic, so much bigger than yourselves, and yet they lack that perspective. And for us, I, I want to encourage us not to, um, to make that same error. You are part of something much bigger than yourself. Um, uh, years from now, people will look back on this crisis and they'll ask, hey, where were you in the midst of this? And I want to encourage you that you will respond, that you were trusting the Lord, that you were serving your family, that you were loving your neighbors. That is a win. Obedience is always a win. And remember, you're part of something bigger than just your own issues in these moments. You're part of the story of God and about bringing his redemption to this world. And light shines the brightest when the world gets the darkest. So people are asking, what is God doing in the midst of this? And we can give an answer. He's bringing about redemption through his son, Jesus Christ. And we see that as um, the story progresses. Look what it says here. Then the women of the neighborhood gave him a name, which is interesting. The whole neighborhood is in on naming him. I wonder if we tried that. If there was, hmm, if there were some kids being born soon, if we submitted it up for a vote and the whole church got to name him. Anyways, um, saying, a son has been born to Naomi and they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of of David. All of a sudden, this little story, boom, connects to the much wider story. And we see David, King David, who fought with Goliath, who penned the Psalms, who God gave the promise in 2 Samuel 7, that through David's line would come a Messiah, a king whose uh, kingdom would know no end. All of a sudden, the little simple story of Ruth and Boaz connects to the bigger, wider cosmic story of God's redemption in the world. And it's a little bit like if you are a uh, superhero fan and you've watched the Marvel movies, you know, um, and you know you're a fan when, especially if you watch them in the movie theater and the movie ends and everyone just sits there and people who are new to the Marvel series will be like, will start to get up and walk away and you go, no, 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 wait, wait, hang on. You haven't seen the most important part and it's called the post credit scene. At the end of the movie, there's a little scene and somebody shows up and they're like, hey, there's the, you know, um, Thanos is coming, this big bad guy, and we've got to assemble a whole team and everyone. And suddenly you realize this one movie is actually connected to all the other movies and is building towards ultimate uh, redemption. And so in the same way, we see this in the book of Ruth, that all of a sudden Ruth and Boaz, their actions and their godliness has a ripple effect that will bring about King David. And then, finally, our final point, God provides a Messiah for the whole world. Ruth ends in a very peculiar way. You would think it would say something like, and David will bring about the Messiah, or something like that, but it ends with a genealogy. And something that we're missing that's super important is why they concluded with a genealogy. And I want you to see that this is very, very significant. It says, these are the generations of Perez. And you might be thinking, wait a minute, wait a minute. Who is Perez? Is that like, is that like Boaz's nephew or something? Like, how does that play into the story of Ruth and Boaz? But what it's doing here is remember the book of Ruth is nested into the bigger story of God. What we see in Perez is Perez is the son of Judah. So follow me back in the story of God. We remember that our first parents, Adam and Eve, sinned against God. That God said he would bring about redemption. And he chose Abraham. He said, through your line, I'm going to bless the whole world. Abraham's descendants had kids and kids until we come to the story of Joseph. And you may remember this in Genesis 49. What's happening is that um, Isaac, Jacob, Jacob then uh, is an old man at this point. He has had his 12 sons, including Joseph. And so Jacob goes around to the 12 sons, giving them a blessing. 
What's interesting is he gives them all blessing. He comes to his son, Judah, and he says that the ruler's staff will not depart from Judah. The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the staff from his descendants, until the coming of the one to whom it belongs. There will be a descendant of this family line who belongs, who deserves, who rightfully will inherit the ruler's staff, will be the king, the one whom all nations will honor. There is a coming Messiah, greater than David, who all nations will come to. And I want us to see something because in the entire Bible, Ruth is mentioned only in one other place. And do you know where that is? That's in the genealogy in Matthew, building towards Jesus. That means Ruth, the Moabite, the foreigner, has now become family and more than family. She is the great, 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 great grandmother of King David and will ultimately be an ancestor of the Messiah to the whole world. Never underestimate what your simple, faithful obedience, loving your family, trying to care for your neighbors, never underestimate the ripple effect that that might have for generations to come. If you're freaking out about your life, if you're feeling like, you know, things are over or you're feeling like uh, you don't know what the future holds, here's what I would tell you. Your actions now matter for eternity. Never underestimate what God will do and know and find safety in the fact that he loves the redemption story. He loves the happy ending. That's where ultimately all of this is going. In fact, you could say that Ruth is the gospel of Ruth, the good news about Ruth, because she's foreshadowing the ultimate good news of Jesus himself. We see this in the setting. They are in the city of Bethlehem where famine has ceased and bread has returned, and we will see that as Jesus comes on the scene, he is the bread of life. And from his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. He is a global Messiah for all people. Like Boaz, when Ruth comes to him and asks him to marry her and to put his protection and provision over her, so Jesus protects and provides for his people. As Boaz went to the city gate to legalize and finish the work of redemption, so Jesus will remember this week that he went outside the gate of the city and he went to the cross to achieve our redemption fully, finally, and forever. The work was done. The price was paid. It is finished. And so I want to encourage you in these times, remember that what you're saying to your kids, the prayers you're praying with your family, the way you're trying to lead in these house churches, or even if you're not a believer and you're watching this, and you're thinking, should I come to Christ? Should I follow after him? What's he doing in the midst of this? Come to Jesus. What more do you need than a global pandemic to wake up to your spiritual need? He loves you. He desires you. He will forgive you. Come to Christ. Know that your decisions now will ripple out into eternity, will have an impact throughout the generations. And take hope, church family in the book of Ruth, that what we have here, history is not a collection of one wretched thing after another going nowhere. History has an ending. And it is Revelation 22, 16. It is the Lord Jesus Christ returning to renew the earth and there will be no more virus and no more disease. We will be raised in holy, perfect, healthy, resurrected bodies. The story of Ruth begins with death and ends with resurrection. You and I's story will end with resurrection. We can have hope. He's working all things together for good. Love you guys.